Amen. Let's all stand to our feet and I'll ask our brother Sam if he would invite the presence of the Lord to be with us. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> when I look into your holiness. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what everybody's waiting for. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, when I found the joy of reaching your heart, when thy will becomes enthroned in your love when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you <coughs> i worship you lord i worship you the reason i live is to worship you I worship you Lord I worship you the reason I live is to worship you When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, when I found the joy of reaching your heart, when my will becomes enthroned in your love when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you Ooh, i worship you lord i worship you <coughs> the reason i live is to worship you I worship you Lord I worship you Ooh, the reason I live is to worship you <coughs> Amen all in the name of Jesus, number 39. <coughs> Truth and beauty and happiness, it's all in the name of Jesus. Health and heaven, peace and rest, it's all in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Joy and gladness, forgiveness too, and life everlasting and free. 
all that I've hoped for and all that I need. It's all in the name of Jesus. <coughs> Jesus, Jesus, He's here and He will show you the way. Jesus, Jesus, He's all that you need today. Care and comfort, healing and grace, it's all in the name of Jesus. Welcome and pardon, a hiding place it's all in the name of Jesus <clears throat> warmth and sunshine friendship true fulfillment and blessings untold hope for tomorrow and help for today it's all in the name of jesus hallelujah jesus jesus he's here and he will show you the way He's all that you need today. Amen. At this time, we'll change the order of service to prayer. And uh, please continue to pray for my healing completely. Um, it's been uh, every time I get ready to go overseas, the devil attacks me with my chest because he doesn't want me to preach. <coughs> when I get over there, as sick as I may be, God gives me lungs and I preach anyway. So I don't know why he just keeps bothering, but that's his job. And, uh, and this is mine. So uh, that might also keep uh, Justin in prayer as he travels. And uh, he should be back Saturday, I believe. Any other prayer requests? Yes. Okay, Sister Helena, her family. Any other prayer requests? Yes. Okay, and did Sister Rhoda make it in today? Yes. Oh, she got in yesterday. Okay. Well, hallelujah. Brother John, um, would you take these requests before the Lord and just come up here and also give us a, your testimony of what the Lord did for you this week? Your precious, kind, Heavenly Father, God, we just... Thank you, Lord, for being able to come here today and bring these requests before you, God. Lord, we just lift up our brother Brian, Lord, his uh, bronchitis, God. We just ask you that you heal him, Lord. Um, we know that healing is in the atonement, as Brother Branham said, and faith is the substance. And we're holding on to that, God, and we truly believe that. And symptoms are just lying vanities as the book Christ the Healer tells us. And Satan, you have no hold on Brother Brian anymore. We claim his healing right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because that is our absolute. <coughs> and Lord, we also ask you for Brother Justin traveling mercies, God, as he comes back on his way home, Lord. And Lord, we also lift up Sister Helena's family, God, that you just show them the light, Lord, and this wonderful grace that we all have, God. Let them want that as well. And we thank you for uh, Sister, Sister Rhoda Shear for being able to
come here, God, to the United States and be with her husband, God. We just thank you, Lord, for all these things. And we are thanking you for everything that you are going to do, God. And we ask you all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't know if probably many of you know, I've, I've suffered with uh, some uh, intestinal and stomach issues. And I've been on five different diets probably in the past year and a half. And I got better for a little bit. And I, and I think what I had to learn was to depend on God completely. Because I was taking most of my doctor's uh, words over whatever was wrong with me. Most of them didn't know. Some of them claimed to be able to get to the root cause, but they they absolutely had no idea. And it was very tough because it got more expensive. To eat healthy, it is, 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 you know, expensive. I didn't have the, uh, um, I guess, the convenience of being able to, um, you know, have something simple as pizza, you know, or or things like that. I'd have to make everything from scratch. And so uh, I guess the silver lining in this, I did learn how to cook, which was, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't have those skills before, so I did learn how to do that. But um, to get back to my main point, um, I would I talked to several people here. Brother Dom was one of them. Brother Derek was another. Uh, sister... Um, Melissa was also another person, and she had given me the advice to start reading the book Christ the Healer. And I didn't realize, like, I I guess I had to come to the point where I knew God wanted to heal me because I didn't think He did. He asked me probably a year ago, I'd be like, "Why would God want to heal me?" You know, I I just couldn't I couldn't give you a reason. You know, I I didn't think I was any good or anything like that to. Uh, you know, to, to receive this, this mercy. And so, um, after I started reading that book, there were a lot of, a lot of, um, just profound words. And it, the same profound words spoken by our prophet, William Branham. And it was like every sermon over, over the past, month or so I was listening to he had mentioned somebody with a stomach issue and he even mentioned his own testimony and how he was healed of that well it wasn't up until I guess about a few weeks ago I, uh, brother Derek uh, talked to him after church and he's like John he's like your negative confession he's like well, why, do you, why do you keep doing that and I'm like, well, I, I didn't really see it as that because I'm like, I have test results telling me that I have this intestinal infection. I, I contracted something called Giardia. And my doctor actually told me yesterday that if I didn't catch it in time, I could have, I could have actually had some serious uh, you know, repercussions because of that. And um, so basically, after, after Derek uh, talked to me about that, and I started reading in the book, Christ the Healer. Symptoms are lying vanities. Amen. Right. And that's, that's truly what they are. Because we, we have a... We have a merciful God. Amen. And before I actually receive word from my doctor what I already knew weeks ago. I actually had pizza for the first time in, I'd say, a year and a half with my wife. And it's something just as simple as that, that I honestly, I was told by my, even my, what I would consider a good doctor, who wasn't my primary physician, but he's, he's what's called a functional medical doctor. And he told me he had, he's had no success with people being able to, with some of his patients, being able to reintroduce some of the foods that they were sensitive to uh, that were high up on the list. 
And I'm telling you, I've had popcorn. I've had, I've had absolutely anything and everything. I've had cheese. They said dairy. I'd never be able to have it again. And I, I'm, able, I'm able to eat these foods again. And I, I just, I mean, my diet, I, I will admit, it was making me bitter because it was, it, was, it was killing me not to be able to eat with you guys. It really was. And it, and it just put more stress on me when I was asked because I was afraid of how I would feel afterward because it wasn't that it made me feel miserable. I'd get sick when I would have dairy and a place would tell me they didn't put dairy on their stuff, I would actually, I would get really sick. And But what I learned about this is that, because um, Lisa was asking me, my wife, she was asking me a couple weeks ago, she's like, yeah, when you went to Chipotle, she's like, you didn't, um, you didn't tell them you had a dairy and gluten allergy. I was like, because I'm not claiming it anymore. Amen. That's right. That's right. And, and that's, that's the conclusion that uh, I believe God really revealed to me. And to get back to the story of when I had had the pizza for the first time is that I was sitting on the couch and Lisa, Lisa was right next to me and she was eating it. And something just was telling me, this isn't me. I mean, I, I, have, no, I have no doubt this, this definitely was not me because I would be telling myself not to eat this thing, you know, because I've had, you know, I know what, I know what it's like, but it was like, have a slice. You can have a slice. And I'm like, well, maybe I'll just take a nibble, you know. So I told Lisa, I was like, could you, um, could you just cut me off a little slice of that? And she, she did. And uh, I had that. And I'm like, well, I think I want a little bit more. And, you know, I guess I had my, my own little gastronomic jubilee right there, because, as Brother Branham said when he was talking about the sister that had the ulcer issue. And I'll tell you what, I mean, just based on that, and I know we're living in the end time. I know we have a healing God. I've seen God's supernatural hand in my life. I've seen myself grow more in the past six months than I have since I've been following the message since 2004. And I just wanted to, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel privileged to be able to come up here, share that, God, you know, share that information with you, share my testimony with you, because... I mean, it, it's nothing but, you know, greatness from here on out. And, you know, I thank you guys for your support and, and your prayers and, uh, and dealing with me when I wasn't probably always too friendly about it. But I love you all, and, uh, you know, I'm just thankful to be able to have uh, a like body of believers to be able to share this with. And, you know, you guys are my true spiritual family, and I thank you. Amen. God bless Brother John. Congratulations. <laughs> Amen. By the way, I, I have uh, about a dozen of those Christ the Heater books back there. If anybody doesn't have one that would like to have one, uh, let me know after church. Amen. Well, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's sing the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. <clears throat> O oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face <coughs> and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there 
over us sin no more has dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon Jesus <coughs> look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you he promised believe him and all will be well then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell. <coughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace <coughs> amen let's all stand to our feet and we'll sing the angel of the lord's favorite song only believe only believe all things are possible only believe only believe only believe all things are possible only believe Jesus you're here Jesus, you're here. All things are possible now that you're here. <coughs> Jesus, you're here. Jesus, you're here. And all things are possible now that you're here. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <coughs> Gracious Father, we're thankful, Lord, to have this privilege once again to assemble in thy name, knowing, Father, that your love for us, you came down in this hour with a mighty shout, with a message to transform us by the renewing of our mind. Help us, Father, to enter into that message, not only to hear it and recognize it, but to act upon it. Help us, O oh God, to become that word manifested in our bodies. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> this evening I'd like to go back to paragraph 56 and cover something I think we missed earlier in our study of the token. <clears throat> where Brother Bram said, but in this case the judge himself has become our attorney. God became man. There was no attorney could do it. We couldn't find one. Moses and the law, the prophets, nothing could do it. So the judge became both jury, attorney, and judge himself and took the justice of his law in his own hands and paid the price of it himself. How much more secure could we be? And sent his own life back upon us as a witness that he's accepted it. <clears throat> How safely. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. And paragraph 64 You'd have listened to the message of the hour if you did, certainly. They'd had a lot of messages, but this was the message of the hour. See, I believe the message of the hour. Yeah, the blood was applied at the evening time. They might have said, well, I'm a Jew. And people say today, well, I'm a Christian. I can show you my long membership. I want, I want to tell you something. Where, uh, where did I ever steal anything? Where was I ever in a court of law? Show me where I ever committed adultery. 
I've, I, I, I've ever done all these things or something like that. Show me one place. That don't mean a thing now. <clears throat> no, no, see, <clears throat> no matter how much trouble he was, the covenant is without effect. It's not effective. <clears throat> you say, well, I'm a Bible student. I don't care what you are. Without that covenant, the wrath of God is upon you. That's right. He's caught up with you. Yeah, your sins will find you out. Now, this evening, I'd like to speak on this witness of the spirit that Brother Bram is talking about here. Because it says, without it, basically, you're, you're a goner. So in order to better understand, I'd like for us, if we would, to open our Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. And we're going to read from verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record or the witness that God gave of himself. <clears throat> now, notice that word again, hath, means to echo. So, he that believeth on the Son of God echoes the witness in himself. Well, you can't echo the witness in yourself if the witness isn't in yourself. This verse of the scripture now has two parts to it. Number one, it speaks of the witness, which is the Holy Spirit. And then it speaks of the record that God gave us concerning his Son. So we will focus our thoughts, first of all, tonight on part one. He that believeth on the Son hath the witness in himself. And again, as I mentioned, the word hath was translated from the Greek word echo. So this verse should read, He that believeth on the Son of God echoes the witness in himself. <coughs> now, we know there's a difference between just being a witness and the witness. For the witness is the Holy Ghost himself. In 1 John 5 and verse 6 we read, And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now, we usually think of a witness as a person or another human being. But John tells us in 1 John 5 and verse 9, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. And what greater witness could there be than the very witness of the Spirit of God in us and through us? Now, to understand what John is telling us here, he says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Let's turn back to the book of Romans, and we're going to see Paul say the same thing. In Romans 8.16, the Apostle Paul says, the Spirit itself, and we know there's only one, the Spirit, and that's the Spirit of God. <clears throat> the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, if we're not careful, we'll read this verse completely the opposite of what Paul's telling us here. And many Christians have wrestled this verse of Scripture to their own destruction because they've read it exactly the opposite of what it's telling them. And thus they've placed the emphasis on what they feel and what they witness within themselves instead of what God is witnessing of our own spirit. Many will make the mistake um, uh, that uh, because their inner voice, uh, you know, they'll think their inner voice or their own imagination is this witness of the Spirit of God to them. Although they might be enthusiastic, or as Brother Bram would say, although they might be sincere, yet they are proven by God's word to be sincerely wrong. <clears throat> Therefore, when we read this scripture... We should understand that it does not speak of our spirit bearing witness to anything, much less to the Spirit of God. But rather it says, the Spirit, which we know is speaking of God's Spirit, for there's only one the Spirit, and that's the Spirit of God. And notice Paul says, the Spirit itself will bear witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. And if the Spirit itself, then it is not speaking of another spirit, but the one and only Spirit, which is God. Now, the Apostle Paul is not saying God's spirit plus my spirit. And he certainly is not talking about mine or your spirit bearing record with anything. But he is telling us plainly that it is God's spirit all by itself which is bearing witness with your spirit. Therefore, we're not looking here at anything that we are to do. Nor are we looking here at anything that we perceive. Nor are we even looking at what we feel in our own spirit. Because our spirit has nothing to do with this verse of scripture in the sense that this verse is, is not talking about our spirit witnessing anything, but rather it speaks of God's spirit that is witnessing what is going on in our spirit. <clears throat> That's the way healing works. It's not what you feel. It's what the word says, period. It speaks of what God himself is in his spirit is bearing witness to it. That is why the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 6 and 3, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives only himself. So it's not you, it's not what you think that counts anything to God, but rather it is what he thinks 
that really matters. You see, that's why we need to have the mind of Christ, because then we'll think his thoughts. Now, in 1 John 1 and 7, we read, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. And if we say that we have no sin, we deceive only ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, and that means to say the same thing he says about them, and not cover them up with our own justification for them. <coughs> so if we confess our sins, <coughs> he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which is unright thinking. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, those people who read 816 wrong, they read it, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. They read it like this, our spirit beareth witness with his spirit. That's really what they're reading in their mind. The problem is that many people in reading this wrong try to convince themselves that it is their own spirit that is bearing witness with God's spirit, and thus that makes them something. And they'll not accept the sovereign position of God that he does not need them. By taking the assumption that it is their own witness in their own spirit and their own choosing, they null and void the witness of the spirit and the choice that is reserved for God to make and him alone. <coughs> <coughs> that is why the token, in the token, paragraph 65, Brother Brown said, what is sin? It's unbelief. You disbelieved the message. You've disbelieved the word. You've disbelieved the witness of the token itself when it's identified itself in the very midst of us. And have you believed that? No matter how much you disbelieved it, it's got to be applied. You might say, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. It's the truth. I accept it as the truth. Then that's a, that is all good, but yet it's got to be applied. So you can preach parousia every hour of the day. <clears throat> you can preach appearing before the coming. You can believe the doctrine, but if it's not applied... So what? You're a hypocrite. And how have they disbelieved it? Because they have, they have con considered their own choice greater than God's choice. And their own understanding greater than the very witness of the Holy Ghost himself. Now listen. What good is your choice if it's not God's choice? And what good is it that you witness in your own spirit that you are what God has not made you to be? Do you think that just because you feel it, that that makes it right? To borrow Brother Vale's words, hogwash. I remember a man came to me one time and he wanted me to marry him to this woman that he was seeing. <clears throat> he had divorced his wife and Brother Branham at 25 years earlier told him, don't divorce her. She was a Catholic woman. He said, don't divorce her. Well, he divorced her anyway. So... He told me earlier that, he, uh, that it was okay with God for him to divorce his wife and marry this other woman who, had been married, who had, herself had been married several times already because he felt it. He said the Spirit of God welled up in him when he kissed her and therefore it must be okay to marry her because he felt the Spirit. I said, brother, you didn't feel the Spirit of God, you felt lust. And if you don't know the difference between lust and the Spirit of God, you better get to your knees. Now, that man didn't know the difference between the spirit of lust and the spirit of God. And the problem with reading this scripture with a wrong understanding is that too many so-called believers have read the Bible with their own understanding for such a long time that it's produced only fanaticism instead of a heartfelt dying out to self. Amongst the fanatical fringe, there are those who are always witnessing in the spirit this or that or the other. But this scripture doesn't speak of what we are witnessing in our spirit. It speaks of what God is witnessing in us by the way that we live and the way that we walk and the way that we speak as we walk in the light. <clears throat> now, the Bible is very plain and says, The Spirit also bears witness with our spirit. And how could the Spirit of God ever bear witness to just any spirit which is not born again in his own image? For to bear witness speaks of identification. And how could God identify himself with any life outside of his own life? That's why I, I've said many times, you know, the Holy Spirit would not place himself in an unholy vessel. You see? Thus, when the Spirit of God bears witness to your spirit, it is not your human spirit he's bearing witness to, but rather his own spirit that has come into you and made you a new creation in Christ Jesus. Because until that happens, you are none of his. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches in Romans 8 and 9. It says, now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So how can he be bearing witness if you're none of his? In other words, if your spirit is not in there for him to bear witness to, 
<coughs> certainly I can be bearing witness to you who are none of his. So we use the term in our daily conversation. We say things like, I can bear witness with that. And what we really mean is we identify with that. Therefore, we must ask ourselves, what is this witness of the Spirit? Now, the real question should be, what is the testimony of God's Spirit? And how does he, God, bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God? So let us turn in the book of John again to see what the Word of God tells us concerning this witness that God is concerning his Son. For here is the pattern that we must follow. In John 5 and verse 30, Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. So it's not looking at what we're doing. Says, As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not, here's the key, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. <clears throat> if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know the witness which he witnesses of me is true. He sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father gave, hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Now notice that Jesus is telling us that the witness of man, no matter who it is, is still not good enough. The witness must come from the Spirit, or the Father himself. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. And ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him, you believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life. And they are they which testify me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. <clears throat> so the Pharisees were saying, well, you know, God's our father. God's our father. Abraham's our father. And he said, no, Abraham's not your father. Well, God's our father. No, God's not your father. They bore witness to it, but God did not bear witness back. You understand? Secondly, how is this joint testimony of God's spirit and our own clearly and solidly distinguished from the presumption of a natural mind and from the delusion of the devil? We can't even consider what is, what is the witness of our own spirit. That is where a man has gone wrong so many times in the past. The Bible is clear on that. It says, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the way thereof is the way of death. So man, by taking witness of his own spirit, he's going to go in the way of death. That's what it says. God also said in Isaiah 55 and 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. Also in 1 John 2 and 5, Hereby you know that we, that we do know him. If we keep his commandments. Whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him, that we are indeed the children of God. Therefore the only way that we know that our spirit is bearing witness with his spirit is that we keep his word. That is what the obedient son is all about. Not obedient out of fear of retribution, but obedient because we have the same thoughts about it as God does. Because we have the mind of Christ. That makes being obedient very easy. You both think the same way. Again, we see in 1 John 2 and 9, <coughs> If you know that he is righteous, that means rightly wise, you know that everyone that doeth what is rightly wise is born of him. Again, we see in 1 John 3 and 19, Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. And God is greater than our illness. You understand? Now, that ought to tell you right there that it's not what your heart condemns or does not condemn, nor is it what your heart bears witness to or doesn't bear witness to, but simply put, it is what God bears witness to that really matters in the final showdown. Therefore, it's not what you bear witness to in your heart, because we're told in Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't even know your own heart, but God can. <clears throat> Therefore, God doesn't leave it up to your heart to do or not to do, to know or not to know, or to bear witness or not to bear witness, but he knows the heart, that's for sure. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 4, But as we were allowed of God to, put, to, to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. And David said in Psalm 7 and 9, Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God trieth the hearts 
and the reins. So it doesn't come down to what you do either, for there are those who think that they do, and they may even think they are doing the Lord's will, and yet in the final analysis, they are not even given credit for what they have done. <clears throat> As Jesus told them when he said, um, have not we done this in thy name, in your name, and that in your name? And, and he says, depart from me, you that work iniquity, because I never even knew you. So they were thinking in their heart, but remember, Jeremiah told us, the heart is desperately wicked and, and, and deceitful. <clears throat> Therefore, it comes down to this. God must bear witness with your spirit that you are a son of God, and that places the preeminence back in him where it must stay. And yet, how does it appear that these people can see themselves doing works for God when God himself does not even acknowledge their works? Well, if they do and, and, and God does not think uh, they are doing, then it would appear that they are not really doing for God because God gives them no credit whatsoever. Then the question still remains, how does it appear that they do love and that they, they love their neighbor, they love God, they love their neighbor, and that they, they keep his commandments and yet are not given credit for it? <clears throat> now remember, Brother Brown preached a message, doing God a... Uh, doing God, uh, I what it's called, doing God a service without it being his will. Thinking they're doing God a service and they're even killing God's seed. Now the real question is rather, how does it appear to God who knows the thoughts and intentions of the heart what they're doing? Rather than how it might have appeared to themselves. For to themselves they thought that they were identifying with the Spirit of God when, when, when God did not identify with them at all. Like Paul. Paul was actually on the road to kill Christians. Thinking he's doing God a service. And God slapped him down and said, oh boy. Knocked him off his high horse. Blinded him to show them that spiritually he was blind. Notice he said, depart from me ye that work iniquity for I have never known you. And iniquity is to know to do right and you won't do it. So God who tries the heart knows our motives and objectives better than we know it ourselves. Now we must ask ourselves, what is this witness or this testimony of the Spirit? The real question should be, what is the testimony of God's Spirit? And how does he, God, bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God? And secondly, we should ask ourselves, how is this testimony of God's spirit and then the testimony of our own spirit clearly distinguished from the presumption of a natural mind or from the delusion of the devil? <clears throat> Therefore, in examining this scripture that speaks of God's spirit bearing witness with our spirit, we must be careful not to think in terms of our own spirit as the one bearing witness at all. Because the Apostle Paul is so far uh, from speaking of the testimony of our own spirit that it may be questioned whether he speaks of it at all. The apostle had just said in the preceding verse, you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry, Abba, Father. <clears throat> and immediately he adds, the same spirit beareth witness to our spirit that we are the children of God. <clears throat> Thus he, the spirit of God, witnesses this at the same time that he enables us to cry, Abba, Father. Now, as I've already said, the testimony of your own spirit, although a good, a good thing, because it keeps you in check, yet it is still a very deceiving thing. Therefore, it is a witness of God's own spirit himself with our, with our spirit, for our spirit, that is what counts in the final estimate. <clears throat> Let's face it. If we believe in the sovereignty of God, then our bearing witness to him adds nothing to him, nor does it take away from what he is. Then what really matters in the end is that he bears witness with us for if he does not bear witness with us, we are lost and will remain lost. <clears throat> the acts of obedience and doctrine and in, in our speech and actions and our submitting our, our own will to God's will is our outward show that we have identified with our role as a son. But these, however, do not prove that you are a son. However, when you are proven to be a son by the witness of God's spirit, then your actions and reactions to God's will will help you to understand uh, your role uh, or the role that God has set before you to play out as a son. Now, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, Brethren, be not children in understanding, but in malice be you children, but in understanding be you men. 
Every man who applies this scripture to himself may know whether he is a child of God. <clears throat> Thus we know first, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And secondly, you might say, you might reason, well, uh, I am led by the Spirit of God, and thus you conclude, therefore I am a son of God. But Paul says in Romans 9 and 1, I say the truth in Christ, and I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter what you say, if there's not a, if there's not a con conscience bearing record, bearing records, what's record? Saying the same thing that he says. Now, to be specific, our conscience is the testimony of our own spirit, that God has given to us to be holy in our heart and holy in our outward at conversation. It is a consciousness of our having received in and by the spirit of adoption those characteristics mentioned in the word of God as belonging to his adopted children. Thus we are conscious of having a loving heart toward God and a loving heart toward all mankind. And we hang with childlike confidence unto God, our Father's words, desiring nothing but him, casting all our care upon him, and embracing every child of God with earnest, tender affection. <coughs> a consciousness that we are inwardly conformed by the Spirit of God to the image of His Son, and that we walk before Him in justice, mercy, and truth, doing the things that are pleasing in His sight. But still, in all of this, we can deceive our own selves. Because Jesus said in John 5 and 30, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Therefore, the witness in our own soul, although very good, does not really matter. I can claim God as my Father all I want to, but until He claims me, what good will it do me? This is the very argument that Jesus had with the Pharisees in John chapter 8. <clears throat> they began by claiming to be Abraham's seed, and when Jesus pointed out to them that Abraham had two seeds coming from him, one by promise and the other by an act of the flesh, then they claimed that God was their father. And Jesus laid out the grounds for, for, for whom you can claim as your father. And he said it this way, you will do the deeds of your father. And this is the witness, this is your witness, his witness in your spirit. In other words, the life that's living isn't yours. It's his. Now, if you are a real son of God, you'll do the things your father God shows you to do. So the witness in your spirit of the, the spirit is a condition of your spirit in response to the things of God. <clears throat> in John chapter 8 and verse 32, we read, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered and said, Well, we be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest then, you, sh you shall be made free? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is, is a servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, for the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. <clears throat> and Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Ab Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Well, couldn't we say the same thing about John fourteen twelve, That proves that you're a son? Because you do the works of your father? Right? I mean, I mean Brother Bram said that the believer is one who's born again. If you're born again, then, you, then God is your father. Therefore, you're going to do the works of your father. You see, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. <clears throat> but now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. And then they said unto him, We are not born of fornication. We are not serpent seed. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, if, you were, if, you were, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear. In other words, you cannot understand my word. You love your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, he will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears or understands God's words. You, you therefore hear them not, you understand them not, because you are not of God. <clears throat> then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say, not, say we not that well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? <clears throat> you see, they always got a name call. Jesus answers them, I am not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. 
Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who makest thou thyself? And Jesus answered them, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say that I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I do know him, and I keep his sayings. <clears throat> but what is the testimony then of God's spirit? How does he bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God? It is, it is hard to find words in any language to explain these deep things of God. Indeed, there are, there are none that adequately express what we experience. But to the best of my ability, I can say the testimony of the Spirit is an inward expression in my soul that he is actually living my life for me. Whereby I can see that the Spirit of God is directly witnessing to my spirit that I am a child of God because I can see he has taken over my life and I have let him do so. The testimony of the Spirit of God must come before the testimony of our own spirit. <clears throat> we must be holy in our mind and heart and live a holy life before him. Not for self-centered reasons, but because we wish to please him uh, in all that we do. And we must love God more than anything else before we can be holy at all, because our desire to please him is the root of all holiness. And we cannot love God until we know that he loves us, because the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And we cannot know his pardoning love to us until his spirit witnesses it within our own spirit. And since the testimony of his spirit must precede the love of God and all holiness, therefore it must precede our inward consciousness itself, which is the testimony of our own spirit concerning him. <clears throat> therefore, when the spirit of God beareth witness with our spirit, it is his living and controlling your own life as only he can do. And, and of this we cannot but be conscious within ourselves of what he is doing. And as Paul said, we know the things that are freely given to us of God. We know that we love God and keep his commandments, and hereby also we know that we are of God. This, then, is the testimony of our own spirit, which, so long as we continue to love God and keep his commandments, becomes a union with the testimony of God's own spirit, that we are the children of God. When, as the Apostle Paul said, our conscience bearing record in the Holy Ghost, that is what John meant by these words, 1 John 5 and 10. He that believeth on the Son hath the witness in himself. Echoes the witness within himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath, hath given to us uh, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. And therefore, he that echoes the Son echoes life. And he that echoes not the Son of God echoes not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know and that ye might echo eternal life. <clears throat> now, in closing, notice he said he was writing these things that they might know that they are echoing the life of the Son of God. In other words, had you been doing it but not knowing it from his own word, you really wouldn't know. But now that you know in his word, then when you see it in your own life, you can recognize God is bearing witness with my spirit. Now notice in our conscience, bearing us record is to actually know that we are echoing the very life of the Son in us. Because he that not only works in us every manner of good thing that is good, but he also shines upon his own work and clearly shows that he has wrought in us and, and, and we see it and we know that it is not us, but it is him doing it. <clears throat> As the Apostle Paul said, the purpose of God giving us his spirit that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God, that he may strengthen the testimony of our conscience in the Holy Ghost. Then our conscience bearing record with his spirit is our own way of knowing that we know. For the spirit of God beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Then coupled with our own bearing witness to the things of God brings us to the place where our sonship is no longer a question but has become a reality. And thus, the joint testimony of our spirit and the spirit of God, our Father, is this, that we lay down our own will in favor of his will. As Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. And that is the testimony of the spirit with our spirit, 
we identify and do the will of the Father, and that is how our will also identifies with his will, and that his will is preeminent in us over our very own will. Now, Brother Branham made it very, very clear in Revelation chapter 4. He says, Sanctify this little church this morning, Lord. Sanctify every person in here with thy spirit, and let the Holy Spirit come into their hearts, each one of, each one of us, and freshen up the spirit in them, who's already opened their hearts through their self-will, has denied their own will, and has come to know your will. There you are. It is a letting go of your own will and receiving the will of the Father. That is the witness of his spirit, his will in your spirit. Isn't that beautiful? He continues, how is self-will? Why will you, uh, why will you call that self-will, Brother Branham? Because it puts the man and woman back again, just like Adam and Eve at the Garden of Eden, on what? The, tree, the two trees, self-will. This one is death, this one is life. Self-will, free moral agency. God placed the first Adam, Adam and Eve, right here on free moral agency. He places you on the same place. And the only way that you can get this thing fixed in here <coughs> is your own self-will. Hallelujah. Your self-will. You have to will to do God's will. You have to get rid of your own will to let God's will come in, for this is the only channel that leads to the heart. Or you can join church, you Baptists and Presbyterians, and you Methodists and Pilgrim Holiness can come to sanctification, but you have to will to do God's will, self-will, to let the Holy Spirit come in here to bring forth, these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall lay their hands on the sick, or take up deadly things, and so forth, these signs shall follow them. That has, that, has, uh, that has let their will become my will. And the works that I do shall they do also. You see how all of these things fit together <coughs> with the witness of the Spirit. John 14, 12. Mark 16. These things take place because God is bearing witness that your spirit has subdued itself and has received his will. I hope you don't miss it. There's a will to do God's will. You see what I mean? Now, the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat is in the heart. It's a seat where the shining forth of his glory in all of his children, the Shekinah glory in the human heart. Here's the human heart. Uh, is, is that right? Uh, is that the mercy seat? How do you come through into it? Through these different systems? Through self-will? Self-will uh, comes into here. And, and through, through there comes out, out what? Shekinah glory. What is the Shekinah glory? It's God's presence. And when a man's walking, or a woman, he's reflecting the Shekinah glory. He don't go into gambling dens and carry on and go out here and deny the word. No matter what the people says, he's got his heart set on one thing, and that is God. And if he's really, truly called of God, then Jesus Christ reflects himself through him with the Shekinah glory doing the same things that he did back, back there. That's John 14, 12. Manifesting the same gospel, preaching the same word, the same word being made manifest in the same measure it was then. Just like it was truly at Pentecost, it's measured back again. Oh, my. <clears throat> and the beautiful part is that the Bible teaches us it is God working in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. That is our assurance that we have been born again. And that is his spirit is bearing witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. 1 John 5 and 10. He that believeth on the Son of God echoes the witness in himself. And the witness we are echoing is God's spirit in us because Christ is in you. The hope of glory. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we're thankful, Lord, for your word. <clears throat> we're thankful, Lord, that you take an active participation in our life and that it is you working in us not only to will but to do. And so, Father, we're thankful for helping us along, prodding us when we need prodding, helping us to be attentive to your Holy Spirit who is working in us your will. And then we give up our will for your will. So we're thankful for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. And may the Lord make his face always to shine upon thee. The Lord 
bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and give thee peace and give thee peace and give thee peace forever the Lord be gracious to you the Lord make his face shine toward you and give thee peace and give thee peace and give thee peace forever